In this video, we look at the Wohler fatigue test. But first let's take another look at the tensile test. In this test, the strength of the stress increases slowly but steadily until a forced fracture finally occurs. Particularly in the case of statically loaded components, the characteristic strength values determined from the tensile test provide important information for material selection and component design. In most cases, however, components are subjected to dynamic loads. With such alternating loads, not only does the magnitude of the stress change all the time, but also the direction of the stress. The shaft of a belt drive, for example, is subjected to very high dynamic stresses due to changing directions of rotation and constantly changing load cycles. Other examples of dynamically stressed parts are gears, chain links, springs, connecting rods and cylinder head bolts. Practice shows that components that are subjected to alternating stress can only withstand lower stress values in the long term than under static stress. Even if the stress always remains below the yield strength of the material, fatigue fracture can still occur over time. In order to test the behavior of materials under dynamically changing loads, the fatigue test is used, which is explained in more detail in this video. In the fatigue test, not only standardized specimens but also entire components are subjected to oscillating stress. For this purpose, the sample is clamped in a device similar to a tensile testing machine. While the lower clamping device is statically connected to the testing machine, the upper clamping device is dynamically set in oscillation by resonance. In the simplest case, the specimen is alternately subjected to tensile and compressive stress, so-called alternating stress. Due to the drive, the oscillations are sinusoidal, some of which have a frequency of more than 200 Hz. Although higher frequencies reduce the testing time, this must not result in an inadmissibly high heating of the specimen. The static part of the testing machine is provided with a linear drive. In this way, the resonator can be lowered or raised in advance of the test. This allows a preload to be applied to the sample to be tested. The stress then oscillates around this previously applied mean stress. Depending on the preload, the stress can take place entirely as tensile stress or as compressive stress. In such a case, one no longer speaks of an alternating stress but of a pulsating tensile stress or pulsating compressive stress. Depending on the application, fatigue tests can also be carried out in these load ranges. A complete cycle through the different stress states is called a stress cycle or load cycle. The stress varies during a load cycle between a maximum stress sigma max and a minimum stress sigma min. The mean stress sigma m therefore results from the mean value of these limit stresses. The stress amplitude is denoted by sigma a. The ratio of minimum and maximum stress is called stress ratio R. In the case of alternating stress, the stress ratio is negative, as the maximum stress and the minimum stress differ in sign. A pure alternating stress is present at a stress ratio of minus 1. Stress ratios greater than 0 occur without a change in sign, so that there is a pulsating stress. In the case of a stress ratio of 0, there is a purely pulsating stress. At a stress ratio of 1, the maximum and minimum stresses are identical, so that this corresponds to the limit case of static loading. In order to test the fatigue strength of materials, several identical samples of one material are produced in advance. The specimens are then tested one after the other. For each sample, the number of cycles to failure is determined at constant mean stress and at constant stress amplitude. Using the example of a mean stress of zero, meaning a pure alternating stress, we will look at the evaluation of several fatigue tests in the following. For example, the first specimen with a stress amplitude of 800 newtons per square millimeter shows a number of cycles to failure of 100. In other words, the specimen completed just 100 load cycles at the given stress amplitude before breaking. The second, identical specimen could only withstand 38 load cycles at the same stress amplitude. The third specimen, on the other hand, withstood 240 load cycles before breaking. This example shows that despite identical specimens and stress amplitudes, the number of load cycles to failure can vary within a relatively large range. This is because even small flaws on the specimen surface, such as fine hairline cracks, can lead to premature failure. The described procedure is now repeated on the other samples. The mean stress is not changed in all tests. Only the stress amplitude varies between the different sample series. In general, the stress amplitude decreases from series to series. Finally, if the stress amplitude is sufficiently small, there will be no more rupture. 
The sample is therefore considered to be fatigue resistant. If, as shown, for each tested sample the respective stress amplitude is plotted against the number of endured cycles, the so-called Wohler diagram is obtained. Due to the extreme range of load cycles, a logarithmic scale is chosen on the horizontal axis. For the sake of clarity, the results are usually not displayed directly in the diagram. Rather, the data is evaluated statistically and a probability curve is given where, for example, 50% of the samples have reached the respective number of load cycles. This stress cycle curve, also known as the Wohler curve, is thus to be interpreted as a probability curve. For the aforementioned case of a 50% probability curve, this would mean that with a stress amplitude of 400 newtons per square millimeter, half of all samples would withstand 50,000 load cycles. Note, the Wohler curve is only used for the evaluation of fatigue tests. For the engineer, however, such a diagram is of little interest, since the Wohler diagram is valid only for a single mean stress. Therefore, special fatigue limit diagrams are created. Of particular importance are the Hay diagram, also called Goodman diagram, and the Smith diagram. More information can be found in the linked video. In principle, three areas can be distinguished in the stress cycle diagram. At high amplitudes, the sample already fractures after relatively few load cycles. This characterizes the area of the so-called low cycle fatigue. In this area, a sample can only withstand a maximum of 10,000 to 100,000 stress cycles. This area is of little importance in practice and is therefore almost not tested as significantly higher load cycles are required for most applications. More stress cycles are only possible if the stress amplitude is reduced accordingly. The diagram shows this in the rapidly falling Wohler curve. This decrease indicates the area of high cycle fatigue. The transition from low cycle fatigue to high cycle fatigue is always smooth. Higher numbers of load cycles can only be achieved with significantly reduced stress amplitude. Finally, there is no fracture below a certain stress amplitude. Accordingly, the Wohler curve changes into a horizontal line. This indicates the area of fatigue strength or fatigue resistance. This fatigue limit is achieved for ferritic steels from about 1 million to 10 million stress cycles. Samples that pass the fatigue test without fracture up to this number of load cycles are referred to as run-throughs and are considered to be fatigue resistant. Note that for a pure alternating stress, the stress cycle curve gradually approaches the tensile strength for ever smaller endured load cycles. If the sample breaks just within the first load cycle, the tensile strength has obviously just been reached. The diagram shows the Wohler curve for a mean stress of zero, which means a purely alternating stress. This mean stress has a particular influence on the course of the Wohler curve. With the same stress amplitude, a higher mean stress causes a higher maximum and minimum stress. As a result, the sample is subjected to greater loads. In spite of the same stress amplitude, the sample breaks at lower load cycles. Consequently, the same number of stress cycles with a higher mean stress can only be achieved by a reduction in the stress amplitude. The Wohler curve is therefore shifted downwards for mean stresses greater than zero. If, on the other hand, the mean stresses are not shifted into the tensile range but into the negative compressive range during dynamic loading, the opposite effect is observed within certain limits. Despite the same stress amplitude, the sample can then endure a higher number of load cycles. This means that for a given number of load cycles to be endured, the stress amplitude can be increased for mean stresses less than zero. The Wohler curve is therefore shifted upwards. The reason for the increased fatigue resistance at compressive mean stresses is due to the fracture mechanism. Fatigue fracture is usually caused by microcracks in the sample surface. These microcracks tear open more and more when subjected to tensile stress. Thus the crack spreads more and more into the interior of the material with each load cycle. With a compressive load, on the other hand, the cracks tend to close and crack formation is made more difficult. We will go into more detail about the fracture mechanism under dynamic loading later in this video. In the case of body-centered cubic materials, a characteristic fatigue resistance can often be observed. This is shown by the horizontal line in the Wohler diagram. On the other hand, with face-centered cubic materials, there is usually no fatigue resistance in the literal sense of the word. For these materials, the stress cycle curve drops over the entire load cycle range. Corrosive media can also cause such behavior. This means that even at the smallest stress amplitudes, the sample will eventually break under a sufficiently large number of load cycles. However, since in practice more than 100 million load cycles rarely occur, 
Samples that can withstand this number without fracture are also referred to as fatigue resistant. At a frequency of one load cycle per second, this would correspond to a service life of over three years. The stress amplitude that a sample can withstand without breaking is called fatigue limit. This is also referred to as endurance limit or fatigue endurance. The indication of the fatigue limit includes the value of the mean stress and the stress amplitude. Important special cases arise in the case of purely alternating stress and purely pulsating stress. For the case of alternating stress with a mean stress of zero, the fatigue limit is then called alternating fatigue limit. For a pulsating stress where the mean stress is equal to the stress amplitude, the fatigue limit is also referred to as pulsating fatigue limit. Due to economic reasons, dynamically loaded components are often not designed for fatigue limit. This is because, in general, components are not subjected to an infinite number of load cycles, but only within their intended service life. Hammer drills, for example, are not designed to survive countless years without damage. Such components are generally only given a certain number of load cycles, which they must withstand without damage. This structural durability is then not referred to as fatigue limit, but as fatigue strength. Note that the distinction between the terms fatigue strength and fatigue limit is often not made in practice and therefore these terms are often used synonymously. To influence the fatigue strength of components, it is necessary to understand the fracture mechanisms of fatigue failure. The cause of the onset of fatigue is cracks or other surface defects in the material surface. On a microscopic level, no surface is perfectly smooth and flat but has roughness and fine cracks. Such roughnesses act like small notches on which increased stresses with a triaxial stress state arise. These stresses can then be far higher than the uniaxial nominal stresses. At these flaws, the yield point is then locally exceeded and microplastic deformations occur. Material displacements form due to slip planes running out of the material surface. Such slip steps leave either bulges, also called extrusions, or indentations, also referred to as intrusions on the surface. These microscopic distortions in turn serve as notches and thus intensify the formation of cracks. As a result of the microscopic deformations, hardening effects and thus dislocation buildup can occur. As a consequence, the material will locally embrittle at these spots. The material cracks more and more with each load change and the crack progresses deeper into the material. This crack propagation marks the onset of fatigue fracture. However, Numerous load cycles will usually take place before the final fracture occurs. As crack spreads, the load-bearing cross-section decreases more and more. In this way, the load is distributed over an ever smaller area. Sooner or later, the decreasing cross-section will no longer be able to withstand the stress. The tensile strength is exceeded in the remaining cross-section and the component finally fractures. Depending on the material, the fracture surface in this area shows the typical characteristic of a brittle or ductile fracture as known from the tensile test. Due to the cyclic progress of the crack with each load change, typical fatigue striations occur in the material during crack propagation. These fine structures can only be resolved with the aid of scanning electron microscopes or scanning tunneling microscopes. However, whenever a strong change occurs in the intensity of stress, the fatigue striations can appear as so-called beach marks. These marks become visible to the naked eye because a change in stress intensity is always associated with a change in the speed of crack propagation. This in turn has an effect on the oxidation of the crack front. Such differently oxidized crack fronts can then be seen with the naked eye. Since the beach marks are always perpendicular to the direction of crack propagation, the initial point of the crack can also be determined relatively easily. If the time intervals of the load changes are known, each of which leaves a specific beach mark, the time at which the crack begins to propagate can be determined, similar to the annual rings of a tree. A fatigue fracture can be detected by its two typical fracture areas. In the area of crack propagation, the characteristic beach marks or at least fatigue striations are visible. This surface is usually relatively smooth due to the permanent microscopic rubbing of the two fracture surfaces. In contrast, the so-called fast fracture surface has a rather ragged surface structure. The ratio of fast and fatigue fracture surface area can be used to determine the magnitude of the dynamic load. A relatively large fast fracture area indicates a high dynamic load, whereas a relatively small fast fracture area indicates a rather low load. Note that in general, no beach marks can be found on the fractured specimens in the fatigue test, since this is not a multistage load, but a single stage load with constant stress amplitude. As explained earlier, 
Flaws on the surface of components are usually the starting point of crack formation. Micro cracks on the surface or sharp edges, such as in drill holes, act like notches where very high stress peaks occur. This also applies to corroded areas. All these spots on the surface favor the formation of cracks. Thus, the quality of the material surface obviously has a special influence on the number of load cycles to failure. Polished parts with soft geometry transitions generally have higher fatigue strength values. Therefore, notches, edges, and sharp transitions in the geometry of components should be avoided. The dynamic preloading of the specimen also influences the fatigue strength. If a sample is dynamically pre-stressed in advance with a relatively low stress amplitude, this can have a positive effect on the fatigue strength. Such a preloaded specimen may withstand a higher number of load cycles in a subsequent fatigue test than a new specimen. This may seem paradoxical at first, but it is due to the hardening effect of the surface and the resulting residual compressive stresses. Under compressive stresses, crack formation or crack propagation is inhibited, since the compressive forces try to close a possible crack and not to tear it open further. Residual compressive stresses can be induced by strain hardening, surface hardening or shot peening, for example. In shot peening, fine particles are shot at high speed onto the component surface. In this way, plastic deformations occur on the surface, which then lead to residual compressive stresses. Shot peening is very often used, for example, for springs or gears. Surface hardening in the form of nitriding is also of particular importance for improving fatigue life by inducing residual compressive stresses. The alloying elements that combine to form nitrides on the surface of the component generate high residual compressive stresses due to their increased volume. Not only the surface of the sample, but also the sample size itself influences the fatigue strength. For example, larger samples have statistically more flaws than smaller samples. Therefore, larger specimens generally have lower fatigue strength values than smaller specimens with the same geometry. This phenomenon is particularly evident with bending and torsional loads, which cause a linear stress distribution in the component and thus result in the greatest stress values in the region near the surface. The animation shows the stress distribution of a specimen subjected to bending load. As an example, we assume that the stress range marked in yellow between 300 and 500 newtons per square millimeter is particularly dangerous for crack formation, since the fatigue strength is exceeded in this range. In comparison, we now consider a specimen with a smaller cross-section but identical bending stress at the surface. Due to the smaller cross-section, however, the stress increases much faster starting from the center point. Thus, the same stress range between 300 and 500 newtons per square millimeter now covers a significantly smaller area. This is again marked in yellow. Thus, with identical maximum bending stresses, the same stress range for the larger specimen also covers a larger area and thus also more possible defects overall. The region near the surface is therefore of particular importance and the influence of the component size is correspondingly large. For dynamic tensile and compressive stresses, on the other hand, the size effect is only slight, since in these cases there is no linear stress distribution.